last time on Radio 3 CSU, CFA, and COVID-19. Something horrible was happening in the country, in the CSU, and with our members. A moment in time, unlike any other in the modern era, a pandemic, a health crisis of major proportion. This crisis, this pandemic has really brought out and shown us some of the weaknesses and vulnerabilities in our system and our way of life. 23 CSU campuses went virtual, lacking a consistent, coherent statewide plan. Some faculty that first week of virtual instruction teaching their classes in their cars outside of Starbucks because that was the only way they could get access to strong enough Wi-Fi. Amidst the confusion, something that may have been missed, vulnerable populations and the emergence of familiar tropes. Hello, and welcome to Radio Free CSU, the official podcast of the California Faculty Association. I'm your host, Audrina Redman. Before we begin this week's conversation on CFA and COVID-19, you should know that this week will be a little different than we originally planned. We're delaying our discussion on the great adaptation and emergency changes to teaching and learning, but we promise that'll be back soon. Instead, we'll be discussing the rise in anti-Asian sentiment in the wake of the coronavirus crises. This is an important issue, and as an anti-racism and social justice union, we knew we needed to change lanes for this week. I'm joined today uh, for uh, later on in this conversation by Dr. Daryl Angen, who is CFA Associate Vice President and Professor of History at CSU San Marcos and by Vang Vang, who is a Fresno State Librarian specializing in linguistics, women's studies, and student support services. Vang is also a member of our CFA bargaining team. But first, we're joined by Dr. Russell Zhang, a CFA member and professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State. He is also a co-founder, co-launcher, if you will, of a website that started to collect these stories and to record acts of violence against Asian Americans uh, that occurred after COVID-19 was announced as a thing here in the United States. It's so interesting to note that within the first year of its inception, they've collected over 1,500 responses from folk across the country. Um, and so I wanted to let's jump in and talk with Russell about that. You know, Russell, tell us more about this this website that was launched, this Stop AAPI Hate, and what is it that you've been hearing from the API community across the country here in California, and maybe even from folks in the CSU. Yeah, thanks, Audrina, and thanks CFA for hosting this um, particular segment of the program. Um, being a professor in Asian American studies at San Francisco State, I knew that um, whenever pandemics hit and whenever they come from the, um, Asia, Asians in the United States get scapegoated. That's been the history of Asians in America. Um, from smallpox to the bubonic plague, um, diseases have been used to create health policies that excluded Asians, quarantined Asians, detained Asians, deported Asians. Mm-hmm. And so I knew that the scapegoating would occur again um, as soon as I heard about how widespread um, the coronavirus was in China. So I sought to document and to actually warn government that this was going to happen. And we, um, and so I began to track news accounts using secondary sources. And we saw a 50% rise in xenophobic incidents. Mm. And in ethnic studies, we always partner with community organizations and partners. And so um I contacted Chinese for Affirmative Action in San Francisco and the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council in LA. And there are two civil rights groups. And together we contacted the state's attorney general to establish a reporting center. Um, Their office said they didn't have the capacity, so we had to create our own website. And like you said, within just four weeks, we gathered over 1,500 accounts of anti-Asian hate and violence. 
So that just shows how widespread it is. We didn't even publicize the site. Where were the, com the complainants? Where were these coming yeah. from? Were they coming from um, uh, mainly from California, since you are California-based and the other organizations are as well? We wanted it to be a California-based site so that we could provide resources and, you know, to local agencies. So if they had um, um, wanted mental health support, they could you know, contact their local agency. Mm -hmm. But we got um, 45 states reporting and people internationally reporting. And about 60% are outside the state. It just shows how pervasive and widespread the issue mm -hmm. is and how, um, again, how much people wanted to air their grievances, to share their stories and develop a voice. What we found was that um, about 80% was verbal harassment and shunning. But these weren't just cases of microaggression. They were actually really harsh, mean, um, racist comments where people were get, you know, yelled at um, with people using racial slurs, oftentimes with elderly and youth present. Mm -hmm. So we know people were targeting more vulnerable groups. Um, women were targeted two to three times more than men. And uh, so again, when you read, it's, it's just palpable how hate-filled people are now towards Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. Another 10% of the cases were workplace, um, were civil rights violations. So people were being treated differently and mistreated at the workplace. They were being barred from establishments. They weren't being given rides to Uber and Lyft. And so um, that's a whole different type of discrimination. And then the third major category was actual physical assault. And those rise to the level of hate crimes. People could have been arrested for them. Um, and so people are getting shoved. They're getting pushed. They have rocks and bottles thrown at them. Wow. Um, a lot of times, Asians are getting spat upon and coughed upon. And so it's really dehumanizing. It's really sort of incomprehensible for me to treat others this way. But um, I think because it's related to the pandemic and the disease, people feel like they could reinfect Asians by spitting at them or coughing at them. Right, right. And um, just, just, yeah, so that constitutes a hate crime as well. It constitutes a public health threat. And in, in the East Coast, one guy who is white um, got arrested for terrorism, for coughing on produce and on the white cashier. But that's happening to Asians across the country hundreds of times. So you could say we're facing mass terrorism um, bioterrorism by people coughing and spitting at us. So, Bang, if I may, um, you, uh, I remember having a conversation with you last week and you were sharing uh, what this is, what this time period is like for you and your family and your concerns going forward. So, can you talk a little bit about how you've been impacted? I think for me and my family, um, I have two kids, uh, one is 13, one is nine, and since the shelter um, that the governor put in place, um, we haven't left the house at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, we go to our backyard and you know hang out there, but to get the necessary shopping, um, you know, buying food and things that we need every day, uh, my husband does that. And you know, he just feels that it's, it's a lot safer in terms of uh, health-wise, having one person being out there than all of us. And he just feels that it's just more safer in terms of him being there as a male. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, to me, I never really thought about it in terms of what Russell was talking about, women being targeted more often than men. But, you know, that was in his head. And he was just like, it's just more safer this way. So I'll just go and take care of the things that we need. And, you know, you guys just stay around here and hang out here. Mm -hmm. So uh, since then, uh, let's say almost a month, we haven't left the house except just walk around the yard. And um, it's been pretty good. But I would say that I never really, you know, internalized that and thinking that my safety, uh, the safety of my children are in jeopardy until, you know, you start hearing, you start seeing this on the uh, news. And, you know, when you call and talk to other friends and neighbors, and they start talking about, oh, I went to the uh, grocery store and I was the only one in line. Nobody was lining after me. Um. And, you know, so it's them telling you these stories. And in a way, I felt privileged that my husband is taking care of these things for me. But at the same time, it shouldn't be this way. Um, even though it's a stay in place shelter, uh, you should be able to, you know, feel safe and walk outside and, you know, say, hey, you know, this is okay. Everybody's in it together. But you don't feel that. You don't feel like everybody's in it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Russell, that sounds familiar, huh? It, yeah, it totally sounds familiar. I think Asian Americans are hyper aware of how they're being racially profiled, um, like how others are profiled um, for being threats or for being dangerous and then excluded or detained or incarcerated. That's how Asians are being uh, experiencing it now. Um, and so if you wear a mask, you're afraid, oh, people see me as a threat and a disease carrier. Mm -hmm. And if we don't wear a mask, people see us as a disease carrier anyway and say we're negligent and so they attack us. So we can't win either way. Mm -hmm. um, we're afraid of coughing in public because um, people will then again suspect us and either shun us or fight or flight mode that people go into. They see us as a threat and they go into flight or fight mode. Right. So, so that's, that's how people are feeling in this time when we're still doing physical distancing. What uh, Bang or Russell might you imagine it would be like when we return to campus, when we are back to normal, so to say? I don't think things are going to go back to normal. I think this hate is only going to increase, and for several reasons. First of all, the Republican Party is making it their strategy to China um, relations, their primary campaign, and they want to make China the enemy so that they um, could avoid being blamed for their administration's ineptitude in handling the crisis. Mm -hmm. They want to rile up their base. And so by China bashing, um, they create a scapegoat. And the, the thing is that the, the um, consequences fall on Asians in America. Um, so there's the China bashing, plus the longer we stay and sheltered in place, people are already trying to get out of the quarantine. Um, and, right. <laughs> yeah. And then people are also upset that the economy is tanking. And, you know, there's... Yes. And then finally, you know, as deaths mount, they're going to be even more angry. So those yeah. four factors are just going to make people more and more upset more and more fearful. And I think they're like we said, they're going to want to blame something or some people and they'll blame um, Chinese and consequently Chinese and American Asians in America. You know, a lot of times when you are equating Asian Americans to the Chinese government or, you know, that robs us of our identity as Americans. Many of us have been in the U.S. for generations. We've called the U.S. homes for generations. And we've never been to China or gone back home or, but, you know, they still think that all Asians are either from or Chinese, Japanese, and, you know, I am Hmong. Um, I don't, to me, I can differentiate the differences between the different ethnic groups and the different mm -hmm. communities. It's the offhanded comment and jokes that really have unattended consequences down the line that harms the Asian communities here. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that every community is experiencing and we're going through this problems and all these troubles that we have that comes with this. But on top of that, you feel all this tension and, you know, uh, you feel like a victim right. when you shouldn't be. But, you know, it, it's almost as if we're always the target to be the victim. Right. Now, you know, um, we were, you, were, you were talking about microaggressions and, and Russell has talked about macroaggressions. These things will play out on our campuses. They will play out among students and between mm -hmm. students and maybe even between colleagues. We're not, um, we're not immune from the messages that broader society gets because we live in it and we experience it and we have the news inputs. But Daryl, let me ask you, uh, as a historian, uh, you know, this, this is, we've seen this before. This is, oh. this is what happens. Oh yeah. And, uh, it, it, you know, if, if, if you know some history or, uh, you know, ethnic studies, you know that, that these kind of things are just not that unusual. And when Russell said that, you know, he, he already anticipated this happening and was ready to get on this and start getting these reports and documenting these things because he knew, right? He, 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 he studies ethnic studies, right? He, he understands these things. And if you do that, and if you study history, you know how these things work. And it's, it's not just the API community. This is a kind of a constant in history when, you know, bad things happen like this, uh, something that's not uh, it doesn't have an easy solution, like a pandemic, um, you know, some unseen, uh, you know, cause, uh, people look for scapegoats, they look for an easy answer, mm -hmm. and, and blaming somebody else 
is the easiest thing to do. And when you blame somebody else, do you blame somebody who's in the majority, somebody who's powerful? Uh, no, you, you, you look for somebody who's not like you, who's viewed as the other, uh, who you think you can uh, you know, put down uh, without the fear of tremendous reprisals. And that's why, you know, especially, you know, uh, uh, ethnic groups, minority groups um, tend to get singled out in these situations. And so you go back in history, you know, my period in the ancient world when Romans persecuted Christians because mm -hmm. uh, this, the very first persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire was when the Roman Emperor Nero was blamed for a great fire that took place in the heart of Rome and killed a lot of people. People were looking for somebody to blame. They, they initially blamed the emperor. And to deflect that blame, he looked for a group that people kind of didn't like already because they were different. And these were these new Christians. This was, this was in 64 uh, CE. And so he blamed it on them and everybody was willing to jump on board. This happened during the bubonic plague mm -hmm. in the 1300s in Europe when people didn't know what was happening. All of a sudden people were dying. And they looked for a scapegoat. And who was the minority group that they could attack then? It was the Jewish population of Europe. And they said, well, you know, they've, they've never liked Christians anyway. So it must be them. They must be responsible for this. And they, there were, you know, conspiracy theories about them poisoning wells and so forth and killing Christians off that way. So that's what happened then. You know, you, you can go to the economic troubles and the problems of the 1930s and how, you know, Nazis in Germany, again, blamed a minority group for those very difficult problems to solve, looking for a quick answer. I mean, and so, if, and if you look at the history then of Asian uh, Americans, right, you've got the same thing, you know, where uh, problems, you know, employment problems, let's say in California, with uh, they blame it on, oh, it's the Chinese immigrants taking our jobs, we have mm -hmm. to exclude them, we have to punish them. Or you look at World War II, oh, you know, all of a sudden we have this war to deal with, uh, and, and it's not just the Japanese overseas or their government that we blame for the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now we suspect Japanese Americans, right? And some, and, and like Vang said, some people had, their families had been here for generations, but no, you now get othered. You're not like us. You must be the enemy. You must be suspected. All it takes is a crisis like that, this mm -hmm. for it to bubble up to the surface into overt discrimination, overt violence, rhetoric, and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been a tool of politicians to use such rhetoric to single out a scapegoat press those buttons and use it for their own political gain. Uh, that's, that's also a standard thing we see as well. And that's why it's so alarming to see that going on now when our own government, as Russell said, when you know, the strategy you know, of a political party is to blame one group, right? Uh, as a way of deflecting blame from their own incompetence in dealing with what the real problem is a virus right it's a medical problem and yet right. they have to single out a group of people to blame because that's so much easier to do we still need to be prepared for what re the return to school might look like what thoughts do you have or advice you have for administrators faculty uh, CFA and students uh, for that return, that inevitable return. At some point, we will. I don't think that any of us will feel safe or feel some kind of normalcy if there is no vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, without a vaccine, we're kind of in this uh, holding stage of, you know, should I make the decision to be physically there? Should I make the decision to teach online, to learn from online? And I think officials and our presidents and the chancellor's office needs to understand that without that vaccine, there is no guarantee. There mm -hmm. is no uh, such thing as, you know, it's okay. Everybody can come back. Um, you have all these tension, all these buildup that's been going around for the last couple of months. I mean, one thing I know it's important is for campuses, their administration, their faculties to really be clear in, 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 in making their values uh, uh, you know, visible to everybody in the campus communities that these kind of this kind of discrimination, this kind of racism, just won't be tolerated. Um, and and I think on top of that too, I mean, I, I mentioned ethnic studies and history. That you know, education in these areas, you know, this this is why you know turning to CSU into some kind of vocational institution is a mistake. 
um, you know, in a society like ours, we need to have the kind of education where people can understand the dynamics of things like racism. Um, and, and that can only happen if we do foster ethnic studies education, history education, education in the humanities and social sciences and so forth. Um, so we just, uh, we got to make those values clear and we have to understand that there's more to life than just, you know, a vocation. Obviously, that's really important. But in a democratic society like ours, um, people just have to be aware of these kinds of issues. That's the only way you're going to stop the cycle and this sort of historical, this sad historical, you know, uh, record of, of, of discrimination like this and, and uh, racism like this coming to the surface every time there's another crisis. Mm -hmm. um, education, I mean, this is why I became an educator, because it's the key, really, I think, uh, to, to, to putting a stop to these kinds of things. In terms of the uh, anti-Asian uh, racism, I, I know that it's not just in the U.S., um, but anti-Asian racism is a global phenomenon. And I think now is the time to correct people who are calling the COVID-19 a Chinese virus or, you know, it's Asians who are carriers and to explain how it is connected to a longer history of racism against Asian Americans. Because as, you know, Daryl was talking about education is important, mm -hmm. but each and all of us can do this right now. And every day that we have conversation with people, with our children, with our friends, our neighbors, you can have this conversation with them. So before we go, Russell, can you just say again uh, where folks can report uh, incidences of anti-Asian violence? Yeah, so um, if you come across an incident or you've been um, experiencing one yourself, you could um, submit a report to Stop AAPI Hate. And also, um, I just want to announce, CFA is funding um, a video about anti-Asian racism in the age of coronavirus. And that could be used for classroom use, again, exploring the historical context, the contemporary um, social political context, explaining the rise of this racism and then how, um, how we can mobilize together um, to challenge it. So um, look out for that video. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Russell Zhang, Daryl Engen, and Vang Vang. We've had an important conversation today. We'll get back to more of those next time on Radio Free CSU. We'll be examining the great adaptation and changes to teaching and learning, the lessons that emerge from the emergency virtual teaching. Until next time, Radio Free CSU. Mm -hmm.